Ms. Kathleen Sullivan, graduate of Cold Spring Harbor High School, is partner and chair of the National Appellate Practice at Quinn Emanuel Urquhart and Sullivan LLP. She is the first woman named partner at any AMLAW 100 law firm. Now based in Quinn Emanuel's New York office, Sullivan argues a wide variety of cases in the U.S. Supreme Court and federal and state courts. The National Law Journal has named her one of the 100 most influential lawyers in America today. Also widely known as one of the nation's most prominent constitutional scholars, she has had a long academic career as a professor of law at Harvard Law School, the first woman dean of any school uh, and at Stanford Law School, excuse me, and from 1989 to 2004 as Dean of Stanford Law School, the first woman dean of any school at Stanford University. She has been elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Philosophical Society. She holds a BA from Cornell University, where she was a member of the Telluride House, holds an MA from the University of Oxford, which she attended as a Marshall Scholar, and a JD from Harvard Law School, where she won the Ames Moot Court competition. We're very honored to have back as a guest speaker today, Ms. Sullivan. Thank you very much, Principal Maddock, for that very kind introduction. And you listed a lot of my academic degrees, but none means so much to me as my graduation diploma from Cold Spring Harbor High School in 1972. <laughs> Dr. Wolanski, Dr. Roberts, Mr. Maddock, Dr. Dolan, Councilman Moyoka, Chairman Hughes, I'm so honored to be here today in this magnificent celebration. My board members, my former teachers, of which I will say more in a moment, I want to thank above all two people here today for whom my entire education and life uh, sprang. And that's my parents, Bob and Joan Sullivan, who are sitting over here. I think it was a trip to Plaid Land to redeem Plaid stamps that led us to drive into the Cold Spring Harbor School District for the first time and to say, wow, uh, my parents, the products of great Catholic educations at Bishop Lachlan and Our Lady of Wisdom, and the first in their families to go to college at Queens College, made education the absolute centerpiece of our lives and of the four children she sent, they, they sent through Cold Spring Harbor High School, my two brothers and my cousin Margaret. Uh, they made our education here at this magnificent school the fountainhead of all good things that came to us later when we moved here in 1966. So I was very moved to hear Dr. Roberts' account from his perspective of how this beautiful, magnificent school came to be. And I have a lot of similar things to say about how it looked from a student's eye perspective. For in an age of increasing specialization in which you talk to PhDs in history and they say they can't get a job at a university because their century was filled. Or at a time when lawyers increasingly look to electrical engineers to work on patent litigation, I think what strikes me so much in coming back to this high school is its devotion at the beginning and its devotion now to the beautiful idea of general knowledge and a well-rounded education that includes as well the arts and music and athletics. Up we drove in yellow school buses in those years. I was here from 66 to 72, from all corners of the community, east side, west side, Laurel Hollow, Lloyd Harbor. And before us stood the varieties of learning, literally enshrined in this beautiful building, then in its first decade and still gleaming new, with those different wings or quadrants that Dr. Roberts described. You knew that somehow the humanities the music and arts, the social sciences, athletics, all of these were laid out in physical variety for us to learn. And as the bells rang and as we walked the halls from English to biology to American history to art or chorus or calculus, we felt a kind of awe that there was so much knowledge in the world that each different subject matter had to have its very own wing. 
Now, in returning, I can still remember this magical place with all my senses. I still hear the ebullient music teacher, Mr. Gottschalk, schooling us in Do, Re, Mi, Fa, So. I can still smell the formaldehyde where the frogs were kept in a biology class for Mr. Cohen to teach us to dissect. I can still touch the smooth surfaces of objects we made in art classes or the typewriter keys on old manual machines that we learned to make go at 100 words per minute. I can still see the beautiful timelines on those antique things called chalkboards by which the extraordinary Mr. Aberg diagrammed the progress of European monarchies. And I can still taste the rudimentary experiments in cooking we produced in home economics under Miss Irby's saintly and patient guidance. Now the excellence of the teaching was striking even then. World-class faculty indeed, then and now. But in retrospect, I realize with ever greater gratitude what an extraordinary collection of teachers the district had assembled for our benefit here. To have had such deeply knowledgeable history teachers as my Ms. Skolnick or these other members of History Corner down here, Mr. Taylor, Mr. Cott, Mr. Norton, to have had such a magnificent teacher of English literature as Mrs. Waller, who taught me how to, diet, how to structure paragraphs and sentences. She's in every brief I write today. To have known such mysteries in the uh, experts in the mysteries of Russia, or what we then called the Soviet Union, as Mr. Egan, was truly a gift. Now there's increasingly data on what a big difference excellent teaching makes to students. You may all have seen recently a study by three economists led by Raj Chetty from Harvard, came out with a study of a half million students over time, suggesting that replacing a bad teacher with a good or average teacher can measurably increase students' lifetime earnings in, a different, in, in addition to other indicia of good health and happiness. As Raj Chetty put it on the news hour recently, a teacher who is in the top 5%, an excellent teacher, we calculate generates about $250,000 or more of additional earnings for their students over their lives in a single classroom of about 28 students. Now, since all of our teachers at Cold Spring Harbor are in the top 5%, and most of our classes were about 28 students big, I think that means we, that the teaching staff here has produced hundreds of millions of dollars for the national economy by the excellence of their teaching. But the wealth we gained from attending this school extended far beyond the material. Beyond our academic studies, we were enriched by the magnificent exposure to art and music and drama and athletics and extracurricular activities on which I still draw every day. I remember standing on this stage when it was a lot less fancy than it is now and playing a part in the Mad Woman of Shio, which I didn't realize at the time would predict my legal career. <laughs> my line was to say, de minimis non curat lex and then to translate it erroneously as, the more there are, the more legal it is. It actually means the law doesn't care about small things. But I still remember the, the amazing feat of taking a bunch of gormless young people and turning it into a production like that. Or the uh, moments when Mr. Gottschalk and Mr. Schaefer managed to turn hapless and unruly groups of young students into polished choruses and bands and even small groups of jazz singers where we learned to scat like Ella Fitzgerald. Or Mr. Shane, who taught us American history but also gave countless hours of his time after school to turning mere juniors and seniors into polished journalists as we worked on what we called in those days the incredible, the ineffable, the ineradicable, the incroyable Harbor View. <laughs> I saw earlier Mark Kahaney here from the class behind me who worked on the Harbor View with me, and I think I was told that Miss Sally Eckhoff might be here. Is this true? Hey, Sally, how nice to see you. Well, she was the art, artist extraordinaire who created a new banner by hand-drawn pen, pen and ink drawings for every edition of the Harbor View that I was privileged to publish then as editor-in-chief. They are still, they really ought to be in a museum. But the spirit that we generated not only produced a wonderful newspaper, but won us a number of Newsday Awards. But it was Mr. Shane's devotion for hours after school to that budding band of journalists who made us who we were then, and who many of us are today. And 
a word about sports, and I echo what Ms. Auerbach said before about how girls' sports were so important a part of Cold Spring Harbor High School long before Title IX and long before the rest of the nation came along. Can I say how much it meant to us to be able to be in the magnificent field house and on those gorgeous green fields from that idea of incorporate san sanatorum that Dr. Roberts described? If I could single out one person above all who made such a difference in that world, it's Barb Sellers, my gym teacher and coach. Who managed to turn, who managed to turn gangly, shy young girls into confident competitors in field hockey, basketball, volleyball, not yet so much lacrosse. That, will, that came a bit more later as it will today. And every time I step up to a podium in court today, the lessons I learned not only from English and history and the Harbor View, but also from the sports fields, the lessons I learned here as an athlete make me an infinite better, infinitely better lawyer. So you see that to me it really was like driving up to heaven on the hill, a place like no other that I was eager to get to each morning and did everything I could to stay late at each night before hustling home to my family dinner, which was such an important institution to us all. I even came back two summers to work here, inventorying all the books in the several libraries and using a system that you would find quaint today. It was paper catalog cards in wooden boxes. It may seem hopelessly quaint today. So let me finally summarize what I think made Cold Spring Harbor so distinctive and so exceptional in those first decades and that I see in the students I met today and in the wonderful production Ms. Oswald put up before us is still the, is still the nature of this district. I can call it the four C, sorry, the five C's, community, capital, civility, curriculum, and co-education. So to start with community, the school's excellence arose because the parents and board members and community members who came together to support the wonderful faculty and administration of these schools were devoted to their children's education, as were my parents, Bob and Joan. I, if you looked for the best school district in those days, you found Cold Spring Harbor, and people made huge sacrifices to be able to live here. Parents traveled long hours on the Long Island Railroad to jobs in New York City and came back at night to make sure their children could go to these schools, as they do today. Uh, the community's devotion manifested in everything from attendance at school boards to cheering for the Seahawks at home games was a huge part of this institution's great success. Second capital, as Dr. Roberts said, such excellence requires resources, so resources. And this community has always expressed willingness to come forward to support the schools, voting for bond measures, supporting prudent measures like the capital reserve. We were beneficiaries in those days, too, of support from larger institutions like the town. And the town put on a form of, with state support as well, and, and some national funding, put on programs for us on this spot. On this spot, I got to sit three rows back and hear Julie Harris read from the poems of Emily Dickinson. I got to hear Marion McPartland play jazz piano. We got to see a troupe of black-garbed actors act the Fantastics on this stage. So the support that came from especially the community, but also from these regional and state sources, was a huge part of why we had such blessings at this school. The third C is civility. The years I was a student here, as Dr. Roberts suggested earlier, saw their short share of tumult and national confusion and discord, the mounting protests against the war in Vietnam, the sorrow and rage against the assassinations of Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther King. We entered this school in 1966 as young girls wearing plaid kilts and Shetland sweaters, and we exited in 1972 wearing jeans and tie-dyed shirts. It was a tumultuous time. I had male classmates, including some brilliant lawyers and successful businessmen today, who put together a heavy metal rock band called Itchawad, which stood for I Just Can't Handle It, What a Down. So uh, what is most striking to me in memory now is that through all of that, the place retained a deep commitment to civility. As Dr. Roberts mentioned, there were forums on difficult issues not protests. There was discussion and dialogue, not heavy-handed suppression. If students wore black armbands to school, unlike school districts elsewhere, they weren't disciplined for it. There was never anything heavy-handed. We learned in that milieu 
how it is to discuss difficult issues with civility that we carry forward to this day. The fourth C curriculum, the sheer ambition and reach of what was taught here. Uh, classics, French, calculus, chem, phys, those interdisciplinary connections between the humanities, history teachers becoming English teachers and vice versa. This was quite extraordinary. I took multiple AP classes here and entered college closer to a sophomore than a freshman. Our teachers and our administrators did not seem to notice or even concede that we were merely high school students. And finally, the last C, co-education. The experience I've described to you at Cold Spring Harbor High School was wonderful for girls and boys alike. I learned here that girls were thought capable of being, as in my case, the newspaper editor, or as Jane Meyer will illustrate shortly, the student government leader. Uh, I learned here that students were capable of excelling on sports fields, and our field hockey team received the kind of expert coaching I described earlier, and, I, and some resources too. I'll never forget the day I got to open up this box of Puma athletic shoes with their smell of fresh leather and realized that we girls on a field hockey field were being handed the same kind of resources, at least for field hockey, as the boys. And even if our crowds on the sidelines were not quite as big as the crowds that packed into the field house to cheer for the basketball team, I had two brothers who played a lot of basketball and we spent a lot of time, my family, on those bleachers. At least we had the kind of lesson that girls' sports counted too. It's, I learned here that there were no heights that men could scale, that women could not scale as well, and thus it gave me exceptional pride to accept an invitation to this event from Dr. Wolanski, the first female superintendent of our schools. So for all of that, I'm honored and truly moved to be back at Cold Spring Harbor High School today, a place that meant so much to me. And to say the most important thing I can say, which is thank you to my parents, to my wonderful teachers, the ones of you who had such a joy to see here today, to the parents, to the administrators, the school board members, uh, and to my fellow alumni and alumnae, thank you for the lucky good fortune to all of you that gave us this heaven on the hill.